Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to teaching uh, the Sackbridge Muncie. I am Carolyn Bennett Glauda from Southeastern New York Library Resources Council. Um, excited to be working with Tisha and teach the Hudson Valley. Um, this is our first collaboration together. So um, I'm really looking forward to this. And I'm mostly uh, going to turn the event over your way now that we've got recording and we've got live captioning. Um, you should be seeing that coming up automatically on the bottom of your screen. If not, uh, you can just click down on the more button and um, you can adjust the settings. And um, just as a reminder, the AI for that does a transcription is slightly imperfect. So just always speak clearly and, um, and it'll pick up as best it can. So um, that's my piece. And Tisha, I'm going to throw it over to you. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Um, I also want to welcome everyone for joining us today. Um, in the chat, if you don't mind putting in your name, your state, your grade level, subject level that you teach, and what type of library area you specialize in, that would be helpful for discussions later. Um, I'm Tisha Dunstan. I'm the Director of Education for Teaching the Hudson Valley. Uh, Teaching the Hudson Valley, or THV, is a program designed to help educators discover uh, the vast resources of the Hudson Valley. Um, we're very happy to partner with the Southeastern New York Library Resource Council and we are excited to have Heather join us today. Uh, Heather Briegel is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and first line descendant of the Stockbridge Muncie. And she's a graduate of the Bodonna University in Michigan and holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts in US History. She was inspired by a trip to Wounded Knee in South Dakota and a passion for Native American history was born. She has spoken for numerous groups, including the first ever Indigenous Peoples March in Washington DC in January of 2019 and she has also become an accidental activist and speaks to different groups about intergenerational racism and trauma and helps to bring awareness to our environment, the fight for clean water and to other issues in the native community. A curiosity of her own heritage led her to Wisconsin where she's researched the study the history of Native American tribes in the area. She is the former director of cultural affairs in the Stockbridge Muncie community and now serves as director of education for the Forge Project. Um, any questions you have for Heather, while she's doing a presentation, please just put it in the chat and then we'll go over it at the end. Um, if you prefer to speak your question, just use the raise hand icon and then remember to mic your mute, uh, mic your, mute your mic unless you're speaking. Um, with that, that's all I have and we just warmly welcome you. Thanks for doing this today, Heather. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, thank you so much for having me. I am technically on vacation right now, so I'm not even in the state of New York. Um, so I'm in a hotel room. So here's hoping hotel Wi-Fi stays the way it should be. Um, and that there are no loud noises outside of my hotel window. But thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm super excited to talk a little bit of history with you, um, to go over a history that is close to my heart, history of my ancestors, Stockbridge Wednesday community. Um, so I'm very excited to, uh, to do that. Um, I wanna first acknowledge that I am coming to you um, from the state of North Carolina um, and where I'm at is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Lumbee and Tuscarora people. So I just wanna make um, acknowledge acknowledgement of that and um, honor their ancestors, you know, past and present by continuing to do things like this, which is spreading indigenous history and awareness. So I'm very excited to be able to, to do that today. And I acknowledge those Lumbee and Tuscarora people um, who were here before, before we were here. So it's really important to do that. Um, I'm going to do a quick presentation, probably like half hour or so, um, on the history of Stockbridge Muncie people. And then after that, because I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A, um, again, you can utilize the chat function. Um, or if you want to like verbally ask your question at the end, um, you can, we'll do the raise hand. And I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. So this presentation is aptly called Not the Last of the Mohicans, thanks to James Fenmore Cooper and his novel that was published in the 1820s. It seems to be that uh, people think that the Mohicans no longer exist, that we're not around anymore, um, that we're nowhere to be found. However, we are. We're still around. We're just known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. Our seat of government is now located in Boulder, Wisconsin. So we're going to go back to the past, then come forward to the present, and then go into a little Q&A. So let's make sure my slides are working. So first, great. So first, I want to talk a little bit about um, the territory 
of the Stockbridge Muncie community and um, where they would have been. So the territory covered six states from Southwest Vermont, the entire Hudson River Valley of New York from Lake Champlain to Manhattan, Western Massachusetts up to the Connecticut River Valley, Northwest Connecticut and portions of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. There were also some settlements that were in Kansas as well. This happened um, during the removal process of the 1830s. There were some people that went down to Kansas to join with the, um, the Delaware or the Lenape who were there, married into those tribes. Um, there were, and then they came back to New York or Wisconsin. So there was a lot going on. And what you can see from this map is there are two circles or ovals. The top one you'll see where Albany is. And that second dot is actually pointing to Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Um, you see the top of the oval go up through Vermont to Lake Champlain. Um, you see it cover portions of Connecticut as well. That is specifically Mohican territory, right? So that is where Mohican nation would have been. Um, and that river you see in part of it would have, uh, you know, is it, the Hudson. And so that is that. The lower part of the circle where you see New York City there, and you see um, parts of uh, Manhattan, that is Lenape. That would have been ancestral Lenape territory. The reason we have both of those on this map is because in today's context, when there's any work done in historic preservation or we talk about our history, because Lenape, Muncie Lenape people did end up joining with the Stockbridge Muncie people, and we'll talk about that a little later on, um, there, we encompass that territory as well. So when we talk about our homelands, we are talking about Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Those are included in every single, in every single talk. So that's just a little bit about our territory. But who were the Stockbridge Muncie? Who are the Stockbridge Muncie? Let's refer to that in present tense. So we are the Mahikania, which are the people of the waters that are never still. We settled along the Mahikanatuk, which is the river that flows both ways. You know that river today as the Hudson River, but to the Mohican people, to the Mahikaniuk people, it is the Mahikanatuk, the river that flows both ways. Having recently moved to upstate New York, um, which I was very excited about moving to the homelands, but having recently moved to upstate New York and learning um, the reason that the river flows both ways, it was really, it was really interesting. I I'm understanding, you know, it's, you know, uh, it's like a, a tide thing that happens. And so I'm, I'm very much excited about learning about the area. And so um, it's really interesting to see the river on certain days. Um, you can really see it go both ways, which is really kind of cool. So um, we were known as the River Indians. And at one point, we numbered around 25,000 or more, which is huge, right? It's a huge number compared to enrollment of indigenous people today, where those numbers consistently are going down. At one point, the Mohican people were around 25,000, made up of warriors, farmers, all of these great people who were there. Um, we were closely aligned with the Lenape, also known as the Delaware. Um, we refer to them as the grandfathers. They were just downriver from us. Um, we consider ourselves related to them and we worked together. There were close alliances between the Mohicans and the Lenape people. So that's also important to note as well, which is probably why later on a group of Muncie Lenape people joined with us. Um, we worked together. There were also a series of land agreements throughout to the Mahikanatuk River Valley. Um, and going forward, I, I won't, just so you know, I will not be saying Hudson River Valley, I will be saying the Mahikanatuk River Valley. And when I refer to the river, I will also be referring to the river as the Mahikanatuk because that's the indigenous name of that river. And it's important to take those indigenous names back and, and understand the importance of that. So um, there were land agreements throughout the Mahikanatuk River Valley area, uh, pretty much throughout Mohican territory. And agreements you'll see is in quotes because um, agreements were written in Dutch or English or French, right? Not the indigenous language of the land. So we use the term agreement very, very loosely because you can't understand 
an agreement if it's not written in your indigenous language, which is why I also make the fact that the entire land base of what makes up the continental United States, we know it's indigenous land, but it is unceded indigenous land. Treaties were written in English. English is not the indigenous language of this land. So if it's not the indigenous language of this land and treaties are written in that language, that's not your first language and you don't fully understand it, you cannot fully consent to something that you do not understand. So I make the argument that the land is completely unseated, um, even now today in 2021. So very important to note that. Um, so land agreements were made throughout the Mahikanatuk River Valley that would slowly start to force Mohican people out of the area. We have a big change that happens in 1609, and that is when Henry Hudson comes sailing down the Mahikanatuk um, into Mohican territory. I was actually, um, just earlier this week, I was driving around um, because I had some meetings in Hudson, and so I decided to go by the riverfront for a little while just to be, you know, sit at the river, answer some emails, kind of be in a peaceful setting, and um, noticed the name of the park was the Henry Hudson Riverfront Park, and I was like, we need to change that. Will that probably change? Probably not, but I can make a big fuss about it. So in 1609, life for Mohican people changes, and that is because Henry Hudson comes sailing down the Mahikanatuck. By 1614, a fur trading post was established at what is now Castle Island. It was huge, right? So you not only had Mohican nation, but you had um, another set of my ancestors, the Haudenosaunee, with the um, Haudenosaunee means people of the longhouse. And so you had um, the Mohawk and the Oneida, uh, I'm enrolled Oneida. So you had those people also taking part in this fur trade with the Dutch. Who could be more dominant in the fur trade? Because this was important because not only life was changing, but economic way of life was changing. You were now seeing the introduction of different items into your, uh, everyday life, kettles, cloth, guns, colorful beads, all of those things. And you were actually seeing money too, right? Changing hands between fur traders and, and the indigenous peoples. So eventually this all comes to a head and you've got the Mohawks working against the Mohicans, right? In what would become known as the Beaver Wars. And these were battles for economic dominance in the area. And it was mainly the Haudenosaunee against the other nations. Within the Haudenosaunee, it was mainly the Mohawks. So in 1628, the Mohawks defeated the Mohicans and pushed them east of the Mahikanatuk, thus creating a monopoly of trade with the Dutch in what was called the New Netherland. The fur trade also though brought a decline in the beaver population and the animal all but disappeared from the Mahikanatuk River Valley by 1640. So it took, uh, it changed economic life, but it also started to take a toll on the natural vegetation and animals in the area. Again, um, you had the introduction of iron kettles, cloth, guns, and colorful glass beads that were becoming part of everyday life traditional items were no longer being made anymore. And this created a dependency on these goods and thus a paternalistic relationship between a native nation and any form of government was formed. So at the time it would have been the Dutch, then it would have been the English, and now it would have been the United States. So that is, um, it's, you know, with that trade, with 1609, so much changes for indigenous people. Uh, particularly in, in the northeastern part of the United States. A lot of things changed. And with that change, forced movement is almost inevitable. It's going to happen. It's a matter of when. So the Mohicans were eventually driven from their territory west of the Mahikanatuk. In the early 1700s, Mohicans were moved further east near the Housatonic, which is a uh, present day Massachusetts, Connecticut area. The English now replaced the Dutch in the area and they aimed at making native nations civilized because according to what the English were saying, we were not civilized people. We were savages. We didn't do things properly. Um, they created, uh, along with the Dutch, they created boundaries and fences when land was shared with native people. And a lot of time, a lot of the land was shared with native people. 
one of the most famous of boundaries that was put up was actually put up by the Dutch on the island of Manhattan, known as Manhattan today. And that would have been Wall Street. Wall Street literally was a wall that was put up. And um, it was, the Dutch put it up to keep the Lenape out of the area. And so Wall Street today, um, you know, when if you're walking down it, um, you know, just know that you are walking down a boundary that was there to keep my ancestors out. Um, Broadway um, was a trade route too. Um, so when you're walking down Broadway, going to see a play or what have you, know that you're walking down a trail that my ancestors used to help, you know, trade and, and gather, hunt and gather. So it's very important to know all of that. And because all of these lands were declared um, that they belonged to the Europeans by right of discovery, the Mohicans and other native nations couldn't defend their ownership in the courts of the colonists. You had no recourse, right? So the Lenape couldn't fight the quote sale of Manhattan. The Mohicans couldn't stop the, the English from settling in their homelands. The Haudenosaunee couldn't stop, um, you know, people coming into their homelands as well because of right of discovery. It was something that applied mainly to the Europeans and not to the native nations who again, were already there. It's also important to note that when we're doing lessons that involve Columbus and things like that, Columbus didn't discover a new world because people were already here. You can't discover that something that wasn't lost and it wasn't a new world because there were already millions of indigenous people living here. So it's important to note that. And as the settlers arrived in the area, the Mohicans became more dependent on settlers in order to survive, as did other native nations. And we talked about that in terms of economic ways with you know being able to trade and to get those trade goods to help make life a little bit easier. But also with the arrival of settlers, disease arrived. Smallpox, measles, diphtheria, and scarlet fever were just a few of the diseases that were in the area. And Native people were very unfamiliar with these diseases, and we didn't have immunity to these diseases. Um, it was something that was new that was introduced to us later on. So we had nothing built up to fight these diseases. So a lot of time, or hundreds of thousands of people died, indigenous people died. And a lot of time, entire villages would be completely wiped out. The Wampanoag on the uh, coast of Massachusetts, which is where their homelands are, faced a great deal of deaths um, due to diseases that were coming in um, from the settlers. And in a lot of cases, their villages were wiped out completely. So it's uh, important to know that it wasn't just war, you know, or, or people just dying because of wars and battles. Disease also played a role in the demise of indigenous people, sometimes on purpose as well. So missionaries, you have the, you have the colonists and settlers coming in, then you also have missionaries. And they arrived and soon entered native villages to help convert native people. Native people agreed to be Christianized after seeing the prosperity of settlers. They also agreed to convert in order to survive. They felt perhaps that the God of the colonists was more powerful. Um, and so I, when I think about um, my ancestors converting to Christianity, I think about it in terms of them doing it to survive, um, to be able to go on another day. So as you know, I do not uh, practice Christianized religions, but I'm grateful to my ancestors um, for doing what they needed to do in order to survive so that I can sit here and talk um, about our history you know, to you today. So I'm grateful for that. Stockbridge, Massachusetts plays a really significant role in the history of Mohican Nation. And I'm really excited that I live only like a half hour from Stockbridge now because it's such an important part of our history and I'm so close there I can go now and, and see it and spend some time in the little town um, when I want. So in 1734, a missionary by the name of John Sargent came to Stockbridge, um, but it wasn't called Stockbridge at the time. It was a Mohican village called Watukuk. Um, so if you're familiar with Stockbridge, the village would have been set up 
uh, on and near where the golf course actually is in Stockbridge. So it's very close, right in the middle of town. He preached to and baptized many Mohicans and they started to take on Christian names, John and Rebecca, Mark, you know, the names that you would find in the Bible. In 1738, the Mohicans gave John permission to start a mission in the village. So that is when John built the mission house, which used to sit upon Prospect Hill. It now sits down on Main Street and it's a museum now. Uh, and uh, the area was located on the Housatonic, um, and it was bounded by the Berkshire Mountains. More settlers arrived into the area, and because of the way it looked, it's very green, it's very hilly, it's very beautiful, and you have the Housatonic that flows right through, um, it reminded a lot of the settlers of an area in England, and so they renamed it Stockbridge. So that is how Stockbridge got its name. It went from a Mohican village to a mission town to the town of Stockbridge. Other native groups who wished to hear the mission's teachings also came to Stockbridge. This would have included the Waffingers, the Brothertons, the Pequots, the Mohawks, the Narragansetts, the Oneidas, the Lenape at some point. Um, and these groups kind of merged with Mohicans. And instead of referring to every group by Mohicans or Oneidas or whoever, we were all just dubbed Stockbridge Indians. And so that is where the Stockbridge part of our name comes into play. Uh, I guess it was easier than differentiating between all of them, but it's important to note that it's also a colonized name. So that um, once all those groups joined, we became the Stockbridge Indians. Not even the Stockbridge Mohicans, but the Stockbridge Indians. So war is part of this nation's history. It's also part of uh, the history of indigenous nations as well. And there were several wars between 1700 and 1800 that happened and the Mohicans were caught up in every single one. And it's also important to note that Native Americans in general serve at a higher rate per capita than any other group in the United States. So we have a long history of fighting in wars. The French and Indian War was a conflict between France and England over the territory that was taken from native people. And the American Revolution was a war about creating a new nation on what we know as stolen land. And the War of 1812 saw native nations who once fought on the side of the Patriots, now fighting against them in order to retain some sort of their homeland. So you see allegiances change. And that's important to note. Um, People tend to switch sides during the War of 1812, which I oftentimes refer to as the Second War of Independence. Um, so that's important to note. And uh, Tecumseh, who is a Shawnee uh, Indian, was instrumental in gathering Native nations to fight against the United States. And um, some Mohicans did take part in that as well. The American Revolution, obviously it's a significant war in American history. Um, I would kind of also argue that it's a civil war. Uh, you have British citizens fighting the British Empire to become their own nation. Um, and ultimately this leads to the Treaty of Paris, which grants uh, freedom of the 13 colonies to form and become the United States of America. So the American Revolution, extremely important. Uh, during the American Revolution, the Stockbridge Mohicans, Oneidas, Tuscarora, and other native nations fought alongside the colonists. The Mohicans were very instrumental in this war. The Stockbridge Indian companies between 1775 and 1783 served at the Siege of Boston, the Battle of Saratoga, and the Battle of Kingsbridge in the Bronx. Um, and in 1783, George Washington held an ox roast for the Mohicans as a thank you for serving in the war because the Stockbridge militia, which consisted of the Stockbridge Mohicans, served under Washington. And so just as you know, the war is coming to an end, he has this great ox feast um, to thank the Stockbridge Mohicans. Um, and then just right after that, we are forced out of Stockbridge. Um, so even before many of us had actually returned from the war, a lot of our land had been taken. Uh, in the town of Stockbridge. So it's, uh, it's important to know that um, this wasn't just didn't happen to Mohicans, it happened to the Oneidas as well. And it happened to a number of other nations that fought on the side of the Patriots and then were turned around and kicked out of their homelands. So very important to know. 
After leaving Stockbridge, uh, we moved to New Stockbridge near Oneida Lake. The Oneida who fought in the war with the Stockbridge offered a portion of their farmland and forest uh, and the Stockbridge accepted. And when they were there in New Stockbridge, the tribe flourished as it did every single time it moved. Um, they flourished. Mary Dockstader and other women started a spinning school enterprise by 1815 to involve 60 Stockbridge Mohican women and girls. They created a grist mill and a school was built in this new village that they set up. And between 1791 and 1793, Chief Hendrick Oppermott serves as a peace, US Peace Commissioner. He represented the nation in the Ohio River Valley among traditional relations with the Lenape and the Shawnee and others that were part of the United Indian Nations Confederacy that sought to maintain territory independent of the US and British Canada. So that's where Tecumseh comes into play. He was instrumental in trying to gather support from other indigenous nations to come together to fight against the British, to fight against the US for a piece of land in the Ohio River Valley that would strictly be Indian country, right? No one else could come in there. Clearly that did not work out, but that was the goal. And Chief Hendrick Alpamot was part of that. And what you'll notice, because we're going to talk about John Quinney in a minute, is we are a nation of statesmen, right? Our people are diplomats. They went to school. Uh, they had a Western education and used that in order to further the rights of Indigenous people. So after we were in New Stockbridge, we then are going to have to get forced to move to White River, Indiana. So that was the next move. John Sargent uh, in his journal records about a third of my church and a fourth of the tribe, which was about 70 souls, started from this place for White River. And they were led by John Metoxen, um, who was Stockbridge Indian. And um, Metoxen is a name that appears in Stockbridge Muncie, but it's also a name that appears in Oneida as well. So it took about a year traveling to get from New Stockbridge, New York to White River, Indiana. And when they arrived, they were going to live with the Lenape and the Miami who were there. But the Lenape had been coerced to sell their land. So when Stockbridge Mohicans got there, there was no place to settle. They were basically couch surfing back and forth um, to try to find a place to go to. All the while, leaders back in New York were and working with people from the War Department where the uh, Indian Affairs was housed at the time, that the Bureau of Indian Affairs is now under the Department of the Interior, um, they were negotiating with the Menominee and the Ho-Chunk in Wisconsin um, for land. So you have the Treaty of 1821 uh, that allows the Stockbridge to move to Kakana, which is along the Fox River. It's in the southern, middle to southern part of the state. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of Stockbridge Mohicans who stayed behind in New York joined. They came to Wisconsin when the tribe settled in Kakana. Uh, in the area, the Stockbridge Indians were perhaps the first English spe speaking people in the area. Sounds strange when I first was writing these notes, but makes sense when you look back and see that in 1609 is when our colonization started. So by 1820, one, 1822, us speaking English, not unheard of. So um, we're perhaps the first English speaking people in the area. Electa Quinney, who is a Stockbridge Mohican woman, was the first public school teacher uh, in the area. We also had the first Protestant minister and the first Christian temperance union. But being civilized <laughs> did not mean you were going to be able to stay for as long as you wanted you could always be moved. As long as you were an Indian, you could always be moved off the land that you had. The Fox River became a major waterway. So once again, the Stockbridge were moved to the east shore of Lake Winnebago, um, which is literally just a tiny bit farther south and on the other side of the lake. Um, it was there when we were at Lake Winnebago that a group of Muncie Lenape came to join. And that is when we became the Stockbridge Muncie community. So that's kind of the semblance of our name and how it came together as well. Um, the federal government under Andrew Jackson was forcing removal in land sessions. 
So a group of Stockbridge Mohicans who feared the inevitable moved to Indian territory in 1839. Many died along this journey. Some reached Kansas and Oklahoma and married into other tribes. Others gave up and came back to Wisconsin when it gained its statehood. In 1843, you had the Congressional Act of 1843 passed. And the Congressional Act of 1843 made Stockbridge Indians citizens of the United States. This sounds good in theory, but what it actually did is it divided up the land that the tribe held at Lake Winnebago. And because it made you citizens of the United States, it took away your tribal sovereignty. And that is not a good thing because we are sovereign nations. Like we were here, that's part of our history. And with the first treaty that the United States had back in 1787 with the Lenape, it established that right that Native nations here in the United States are sovereign nations. So when the Congressional Act of 1843 passes and makes us citizens, it takes away a lot of those rights. It also, um, within the tribe itself, causes a divide between, uh, it, there's a split between the Indian party, those who join a group called the Indian party, who were like, no, we are sovereign citizens, we are Mohican, um, that is who we are. And then the citizen party, which were all about being citizens of the United States. Again, being a citizen of the United States, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying when they passed that act, it took away our tribal sovereignty. So you had people like John Quinney who traveled to Washington DC about 10 times just on this act alone, who finally in 1848 gets the Congressional Act of 1848 passed. And what that does is it reverts us back to our citizenship and recognizes our tribal sovereignty as Mohican people, which is a really important thing. At the same time though, the tribe is on the move again. The Treaty of 1856 establishes a reservation for the Stockbridge Muncie community in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, in Shawano County in the townships of Bartlemy and Red Springs. Farming was attempted, but the land was sandy and swampy and it still is today, but we have mechanized farming. So it's a little easier to do that. Um, forestry became a base of the economy and, but the land is really rich in timber. Even today, it's still very rich in timber. So outsiders came in, clear cut the land, and in 1871, the tribe was forced to sell 54 sections of forested land in order to survive. And I just wanna take a moment and um, just talk about John Quinney for just a moment. He, again, was a huge diplomat um, in, in our community, did a lot of good, traveled to DC a number of times to lobby on behalf of, of the Stockbridge Muncie people but indigenous nations in general. And this is just an excerpt from a speech that he gave on July 4th, 1854 in Reedsville, New York. Um, and it's, uh, you know, 4th of July, obviously a significant date in US history, but what does it mean to indigenous people? And so this quote is, let it not surprise you, my friends, when I say that the spot on which we stand has never been purchased or rightly obtained and that by justice, human and divine, it is the property now of the remnant of that great people from whom I am descended. They left it in the tortures of starvation and to improve their miserable existence. These events are not above our comprehension and for wise purposes. For myself and my tribe, I ask for justice, and I believe it will sooner or later occur. And may the great and good spirit enable me to die in hope. And that was given July 4th, 1854 at Reedsville, New York. So um, I encourage you actually to read the entire entirety of his speech. It's very long, but it's very much worth it. Um, federal, uh, again, this is a map of where the uh, reservation is. You'll see just above is the Menominee Reservation, which Menominee Reservation, you can actually see from space, from satellite photos, because it is so heavily forested. It is located in Shawano County. Again, the area was rich in timber, but lumber barons came in to clear cut the land. By the 1930s, the Stockbridge Muncie were left virtually landless because a lot of times they then had to turn and sell their land in order to feed their families. And it's very important to know that. Federal policies had also had started to take in a toll on native nations. 
the passage of the IRA, which is the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934, stopped the policy of allotment and made it possible for tribes to form their own governments. In 1937, a new constitution was written based on the BIA model, and there was now a land base for um, people to build homes on. The Stockbridge Muncie community regained 15,000 acres in the township of Bartlemy. 2,500 were placed in trust, and in 1972, the remaining 1,300 were placed in trust. Being placed in trust is uh, being held by the federal government. It's not considered fee land. Fee land is land you pay taxes on. The Indian Reorganization Act encouraged the reestablishment of tribal governments across the nation. Um, the tribes could adopt their own constitutions, or they could write one of their own. Many adopted the constitutions that were written by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and kind of put in things where they wanted it to be. Um, under the leadership of Carl Miller, whose photo here is at the top, the Stockbridge Muncie reorganized their tribal government and regained federal recognition. Using federal funds secured through the BIA, the tribe managed to buy back a lot of its land, like I said, 15,000 acres, and current, um, they, in 1972, the federal government placed about 13,000 acres of the land into federal trust for the tribe. And that's very important. Um, the picture uh, at the bottom here is that of Arvid Miller, who was tribal leader, <clears throat> excuse me, for 26 years. He was also instrumental in the formation of the Great Lakes Intertribal Council and the National Congress of the American Indians. Both are groups that lobby on behalf of indigenous people. Um, so these were really great leaders that we had in our community. Stockbridge Muncie today is the largest employer in Shawano County with a land base that falls just under 25,000 acres. Some of that is fee land, some of that is trust. We have an enrollment around 1,500, so small, but not the last of the Mohicans. We're continuously growing. History today. The history for the Stockbridge Muncie community is done in a lot of different ways. Um, I would like to note that these uh, photographs were taken pre-pandemic, so there have been no large gatherings um, that the Stockbridge Muncie community has had today because obviously the pandemic prevents us from doing that. But we have the Arvid E. Miller Memorial Library Museum, which houses the largest set of Mohican archives in the world. Anything you want to know about Mohican history, you can find here in this little tiny library um, in Bowler, Wisconsin. Our historic preservation office um, that the tribe has um, preserves and protects sites of cultural significance in our homelands, and also works on the repatriation of ancestors from museums. And then like many other tribes, the tribe is also working on language revitalization. We're unique in the fact that we have two languages. We have our Muncie language, which has been working in revitalization for quite a long time. Um, and then we also have um, our Mohican language, which just in the past, five or so years is starting to make a comeback. It's a language that is asleep for a very long time, but I'm very excited to report that we do have people in the community today who can speak a little bit of the Mohican. I only know about a couple words, uh, so nothing really right home about, but it's very, uh, very cool to see this being happening over time. I also then wanted to show you this, which is our many trail sign, which was created by Edwin Martin who's a Stockbridge Mohican man, and it means strength, hope, endurance, and survival. So when you see this symbol, this is a symbol of the Stockbridge Muncie community, and every single line means something, whether it's the circles that talk about our, our many council fires, the cross you can see that's created uh, for Christianity, and the straight lines that show the many trails that we have been on. So again, it means strength, hope, endurance, and survival. And then finally, just for some further reading, uh, A Nation of Statesmen by James Oberly, The Mohicans of Stockbridge by Patrick Fraser, The Mohicans and Their Land and the Mohicans and the Mohican World by Shirley Dunn are great books to continue to read on Stockbridge Wednesday history. And then for indigenous history overall, I recommend An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz and The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee by David Troyer. So that is just um, a little bit of the reading that, um, that I recommend. And then I am a historian first. Um, I love to, but I also work in, you know, education and curriculum development um, and, and museums. So if you wanna see 
some of the great work that um, I do, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Actually, on Instagram, I just post a bunch of photos of my dogs. So if you want to see really cute dogs, follow me on Instagram. Um, but if you want to learn more about the work that I am doing with different museums and locations, you can follow me on Twitter for that. But I want to thank you guys for taking some time out of your day to join me to learn more about Stockbridge Wincy history and maybe a little bit of Indigenous history as well. And so with that, I will uh, open this to any questions that, that you might have. Um, very excited to hear. Again, if you want to utilize the chat to put questions in the chat. Um, if not, please feel free to um, unmute yourself or raise your hand and, and ask questions that way. And I want to thank you guys so much for uh, allowing me to be part of your day. Yes, I see you, Brett. Hi, Heather. So thank you so much for, for uh, just really uh, insightful information. Um, so I just so appreciate your your time and your expertise. Um, recently, I've been reading some articles and trying to get uh, as good of clarity as I can on um, sort of the language of First Nations, Indigenous American, Native American, and Indian American. Um, and, and the answer I keep coming down to, which makes a lot of sense to me, is ultimately different people are going to have different preferences for how they identify. And so the best thing to do is ask and have a conversation around it. Um, uh, and I heard you in the presentation mention, you know, the, the word, you know, uh, Indian many times. So I, I guess just out of my own curiosity, um, uh, if you have any insight on, on what I imagine is sort of an ongoing conversation, uh, when it comes to language. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I work a lot in the past um, and with federal Indian policy. And so everything is always written Indian, right? Even in treaties, it's always Indian. Um, and you'll see that also recognized in a lot of names for federally recognized tribes, like for the Menominee, they're the Menominee Indian tribe of Wisconsin, right? So it's right in their name. Um, but it's also important to note that that is um, a colonized word as well. I mean, Columbus thought he was in the East, Indies, which he was not. Um, so that's why he dubbed everyone there Indians, incorrect terminology. Um, so I equate, so I use the terms interchangeably. Um, but when I refer to myself, I refer to myself as an indigenous person. I refer to myself as Oneida and Stockbridge Muncie. Um, Others may refer to themselves as Ojibwe or Ashinabe or Haudenosaunee or things like that. So it's, um, I equate it to pronouns. If you're not sure, ask, because everyone's gonna be a little bit different. So um, absolutely, I would just, I don't think it's bad practice to ask. And actually, I think you might find appreciation from those um, who uh, appreciate that. And because they're like, you know, some people go by their nation, some people just go by indigenous. And even like Native American has kind of started to take on a negative connotation. Um, it's been taken over by nationalistic groups. Um, and so that's something that we want to steer clear of. So um, I think indigenous here in Canada, they use First Nations. Um, so yeah, I would just, to be safe, I would always just ask. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I see someone put something in the chat about First Nation. Where does First Nation stand? That's usually referred to as the Canadian tribes. Yeah, yeah. Peter, did you have any more to elaborate on that, or did you? Um, yes. Hi, Peter Che from um, Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, I've um, I've been using First Nation. I belong to our Land Acknowledgement Committee here in Brooklyn. It was actually formed to um, acknowledge the Lenape people. Uh, the First Nation people of this area who you've addressed today as well. It's interesting hearing how you had that connection and that clarified a lot for me this afternoon. Um, I also, as you probably can probably tell by my accent, I'm not a native Brooklynite. I actually come from Australia and um, have done work with our people, the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And uh, First Nation is something I've adopted here since living in the US for the last 20 years. And as you say, it seems more of a Canadian slant, but I've been using it more here in New York as well. And I've also been trying to look at 
rather than identify just one or two um, local peoples, is actually use Indigenous peoples. So I was asking you about that. I did hear you just mention that. And I would actually like to change the name of our Land Acknowledgement Committee to Indigenous Peoples Committee. I was just wondering what you thought about that. Um, you wanted to change the committee name to what? Indigenous Peoples Committee. Are there Indigenous people on the committee? There are some, and we have Indigenous um, people as staff members of the library. And of course, we have Indigenous persons as patrons of our library. So um, land acknowledgement is just one facet of what I feel Indigenous people should be recognised for. So they should have their land rights acknowledged and their land acknowledgement acknowledged. And so I was just wondering what you thought about uh, opening it up more to Indigenous people. Um, yeah, I think like definitely opening it up to Indigenous people is not a bad thing. I think in terms of land acknowledgements and things like that, they have, there has to be action behind there. I mean, if you have words that say, oh, I'm on the ancestral homelands of the Lenape people, that's great, but it doesn't mean anything until you put action into that. So I think working with the indigenous people that work within your organization, um, but also not putting it solely on the indigenous people that work uh, for, the, for your organization, because I do feel a lot of times that work it's put on indigenous people can kind of inadvertently come off as tokenism. So you wanna make sure that people are working together. Um, so I wouldn't rely solely on the indigenous people um, because that work is it's time consuming, it's emotional labor, um, it's, it's a lot to, to put into, but I would um, definitely include in the process. And then when it comes to naming of the committee or the organization, I would get input from everyone. Right, well, I have actually tried that and I haven't been putting the onus onto the Indigenous persons on the committee or within the staff. What I've been trying to do is acknowledge the fact that they are there because they have been unrepresented and they have been invisible for such a long period of time. So that's where my focus has been tried to be. And we actually have been working with the Lenape Centre here in Manhattan uh, for the last year and a half. We did I did some mediated sessions for last year's Indigenous Peoples Day. We did one in November, a Lenape's perspective of Thanksgiving, which was recorded by the library, if people would like to hear it. Whereas we took a slant from the Lenape speakers as to how they saw Thanksgiving rather than from a white point of view. And this last, thing, uh, this last Indigenous Peoples Day, I ran an Indigenous film festival over four nights, which is a virtual film festival with movies from North America, Canada, Central America, New Zealand, and also Australia. So yeah. I've been trying to expand it to Indigenous peoples. Right, yeah, and that, that's really good. And I, um, I, do a, I, I, do, I do a ton of work with Lenape Center. Um, I do a lot of their land acknowledgement workshops and, and things like that. So that's great that you're working with them. I'm very excited that you're, that you're doing that. I think to amplify, Indigenous peoples of voices, it's also to be a good accomplice. And a good accomplice um, put, doesn't speak for those voices, they put those voices first. So I think um, there's a fine line that as an accomplice, you have to walk. Um, but I think, you know, I think you're heading in the right direction. And so, um, you know, I, I can't wait to see what, um, what else, uh, you put out there. So thank you. Thank you so much for your help and, and being in, a, in that situation. Um, I see Claudia, you have your hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for um, coming today, Heather. I've really have learned a lot and appreciate your time. Um, I'm, the reason I'm asking a question is, is about that, is about land acknowledgement specifically. The, so my library, we're um, in Haverstraw, New York, which is Rockland County. Um, and, uh, and we're having a big event next month where we're celebrating our 125th birthday and um, Haverstraw recently celebrated their, you know, the 400th birthday, you know, of, um, of the town. And, and so I, I would like us to do a land acknowledgement for the Lenape, um, but what I don't, I, do, I absolutely don't want to 
say words without action. <laughs> and so I'm just wondering what, um, you know, what resources maybe you could suggest for me to, to look to, to, to really, you know, how, how can, instead of just kicking off this big party for us and then go eating some ice cream, you know, what, what can we do together as a community? So I wonder if you could maybe share some resources. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. So some great actions to put into play um, involve, um, you know, obviously acknowledging the nation, but then um, working with that nation, uh, donating time to that nation, um, monetary support to indigenous-led causes, businesses. Um, you can go even further deep into commitments to land back and um, and doing that. And I think you know what. <laughs> What's really cool is if you can get it done at your town level, um, actually, you know, that's huge for towns to towns and um, cities to do those types of land acknowledgements. That's really huge. Of course, always you're going to get pushback um, from people because they have to then acknowledge that hard truth that they're living on stolen land. But I mean, it's so simple and it can totally be done. But I think, you know, working with the nation that you are trying to honor and asking what their needs are, are very important. And that's an action step that you can take within doing the land acknowledgement itself. So that that's huge. So th that's just a start. Um, and you can also, I would also reach out to Lenape Center. Who knows, they might refer you back to me because I did do a lot of their land acknowledgement workshops. But um, yeah, I think those are just a few easy, quick steps that you can you can put, put into work as well. So I hope those help. Um, yeah. Looks like we have, good, Thanks. good, good. Good. We have something in the chat. Um, Heather and the classroom teachers here. How do you feel about the content we learned here today fits or not into the New York State curriculum? How can teachers, librarians better this fit, uh, better fit this into classroom activities? I leave that to the educators. I don't know what's required of you in New York just yet. I know where I moved from in Wisconsin. <laughs> We have something called Act 31, which requires the teaching of indigenous histories in K through 12 schools. There's not a lot of enforcement of it. So you have some teachers who do really excellent work. And then you have others who say there were Indian people here and leave it at that. So, I mean, I think if anything, I think this borders on a question in regards to critical race theory, which a lot of people don't want to like talk about because it's icky and it gives you bad feels because not you bad feels but like it gives you bad feels because you've got to you know confront a past that is not that pleasant but if we don't confront that past we're bound to repeat it um and so to me critical race theory is just teaching truth um and so I would encourage you to take you know what you've learned today or what you will learn by looking at other resources and put those into your classrooms as well. Um, and Peter did add to this chat too, because and, and, and I'm aware of this. Um, there's um, uh, an exhibit that uh, the Lenape Center has been working on, which I'm actually meeting with Lenape Center to go over some stuff in regards to this exhibit. So um, it'll be at the uh, Brooklyn Library, which is really exciting. Um, we have another thing in the chat. Are there any current specific projects in place that Stockbridge Muncie would like to see support from people currently living on their land? As a research ed librarian, I would love to lift up the right conversations on the college campus that I work. Um, yeah, the Stockbridge Muncie community always has projects going on. I encourage you to visit their cultural affairs uh, Facebook page, but I know um, I did used to work for the community. I don't work for the community anymore, but I do know that there were a number of grants that came in in regards to um, archaeology projects in Stockbridge specifically that were um, geared towards one, finding that Oxford site of George Washington's, and two, um, it was another site can't remember what the site was now, but it was still in Stockbridge. Um, so they're always working on, on things like that. Um, there are also donation links that you can go to, um, mohican.com, the cultural affairs page. There are donation links too, where you can donate to the various 
um, departments, whether that's language, historic preservation, or the library and museum. Um, I see Carolyn. <laughs> I love raising the hand in the meeting that I'm hosting. Um, but a question that just occurred to me, and thank you so much for this. Um, we've also been trying to do land recognitions before events. Um, didn't do it this time, just because I knew that this whole event was a land recognition. Um, but one thing that I've struggled with is pronunciation. And this is a, just a very simple question. Do you have a resource to pronunciation guides? I think I've been saying he can talk wrong um, for instance, and I could use some practice. Yeah, so for Mohegan language, if you go to, is it, I think it's mohegan-language.com. It's an online talking dictionary that um, you can click on the words and you can hear them pronounced either by the linguist that has worked with the tribe or by community members, which is really cool. And then there's also one for Lenape language as well. Um, so yeah, there's lots of great resources. Um, I said things wrong for a very long time and I still do. Um, sometimes I can't get Mahikanatuk out right or Mahikaniuk. So, or sometimes they say them and they sound the same and I'm like, oh, they're different. But um, yeah, but um, also Native Knowledge 360, which is run by the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian also has pronunciations in there as well. So yep, yeah, those would um, those I think would be really helpful. Too. Thank you. Of course. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, I did see a little comment from Adriana. Yes, please uh, email me or reach out on DM me on Twitter or whatever, and we can chat more. Um, but. Yeah, I just thank you guys so much for being part of this. Um, I think, you know, the more we can talk about indigenous history, the more we can bring awareness to it, the more people learn about it. So I really thank you guys for spending a little bit of your Thursday with me and um, please feel free to reach out if you have any more questions. And um, thank you to Carolyn and Tisha for hosting this. And thank you guys for uh, coming. Thank you, bye. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks.